Excellent. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is how we can generate both horizontal and vertical parallax using a uh, dense uh, autostereoscopic projector array. Now the brute force way of generating vertical parallax would be to have a full 2D array uh, of video projectors, sort of like this, where each projector basically serves as a angularly varying pixel. And if you have enough projectors and they're far enough away so you don't see any gaps, you would have full horizontal and vertical parallax, so the image would change as you move horizontally and vertically. Uh, unfortunately, this is rather impractical, because um, right now these I mean, require thousands and thousands of video projectors. Uh, so it would cost a lot of money, and it would take up a lot of space, um, I think, as the previous talk uh, referenced. But as projectors are becoming smaller and cheaper, it is possible to build a one-dimensional array of projectors. Uh, for just providing uh, horizontal parallax only. Now, you, you now need to add some sort of diffusing screen to basically fill in the gaps. Uh, you can use a vertically diffusing screen to scatter the light from the projectors vertically, so each projector lens now gets scattered into a vertical plane. Uh, and then you can add a uh, slight horizontal diffusion to fill in the horizontal gaps, and these horizontal gaps correspond to the, basically the spaces remaining between the projectors. And this will give you a seamless 3D image that will change as you move uh, horizontally left and right. And this is nice because, in general, people tend to move in the horizontal plane. People aren't jumping up and down all the time, but people are walking around your display. Uh, similarly, you could have multiple people sitting like side by side. Um, however, people do tend to be different heights. Some people are taller, some people are shorter, and you'd want people who are shorter to be able to look up at your 3D scene and see like the underside of the teapot. People who are taller would be able to look down and see the top of the teapot. However, with a uh, horizontal parallax-only display, you don't get any of this vertical parallax effects. And in fact, the image sort of eerily follows you and just sort of shows foreshortening as you move uh, vertically. So our solution is to try and com uh, have a hybrid technique where we use uh, autostereoscopic horizontal parallax. However, we combine it with uh, user tracking uh, of multiple users in order to dynamically update the vertical parallax for each viewer's position. And this is possible because each viewer is, in effect, receiving their own customized view going with these angularly varying pixels. Now, the challenge here is that we only have these sparse tracked viewers, and we want to interpolate a continuous uh, estimate of the viewer height across all directions. And secondly, we have to deal with the fact that uh, tracking systems tend to have a lot of errors. They have a lot of latency, and they also are fairly inaccurate. So our system needs to be able to handle all this in sort of a way that reduces crosstalk. So the idea of having a projector array actually goes back to the 1930s, where uh, Ives uh, built a projector array was coming out of the area of lenticular printing, where they had an array of uh, slide projectors projecting onto a two-layer lenticular screen. It had one a set of uh, cylindrical lenses that would focus the light down onto a diffuse uh, screen, and then a second set of uh, cylindrical lenses that redistribute those rays out to uh, different directions. So in this case, each uh, eye is seeing having angular uh, different rays coming from different directions. Now, the, the drawback of this is that uh, you need to have very precise alignment of the projectors and the lenses. And secondly, at some point, the lenses will start to self-occlude. Uh, so this lens will uh, occlude this adjacent lens. So this sort of limits the overall uh, field of view that you can achieve. Now, you can actually also achieve an autostereoscopic projector array with a simpler technique, uh, as I alluded to earlier, where you just use a single uh, screen with a, a wide vertical anisotropic scattering. Now, the, the advantage here is you don't need to have precise alignment of the projectors in the screen. Uh, but the, what's happening here is that the screen is basically preserving the original angular distribution of light from the projectors. So light going through the screen basically continues in the same direction as just diffused vertically. Now, the, the one thing I also want to point out here is that there's no longer a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between projectors and viewers. So for a particular viewer, they're actually seeing slices or pixels coming from multiple projectors. 
So here you have uh, this projector illuminating the eye from the right, and this projector illuminating uh, light from the left. Now, uh, the similar effect was, uh, has been observed in uh, spinning anisotropic uh, displays, uh, such as, oh, before I get to that, there are actually commercial systems, uh, or existing systems that have used these anisotropic, uh, vertical anisotropic screens, such as the Holographica system, uh, there's the Quartico and all, uh, system from 2012, and the Yoshida uh, tabletop system from 2011. Now, going back to those spinning anisotropic screens, uh, these have a single video projector, but the anisotropic screen moves, reflecting uh, light to different viewing positions. Now, most of these systems have all assumed uh, constant height uh, and distance across all the viewers. Now, uh, our group back in 2009 developed a, a teleconferencing system using a spinning mirror. And here we actually uh, model the fact that different viewers can be different heights in order to achieve uh, accurate eye gaze. Now, in order to do this, we needed to sort of assume that there was a constant height at least across each projector frame. Uh, so we then used a Connor cave uh, mirror to refocus the light from a particular projector down to a sort of a more localized uh, viewing area. Uh, in this work, I'm going to explain how to do the same thing, but without using special optics and just sort of uh, adjusting the rendering algorithm to uh, localize uh, the vertical parallax. This would, be a, this would be a top view. So actually, this is an unfolded uh, optical system. So th really, this projector would probably be above and be reflecting off a spinning mirror. And then that would go out to the uh, lens. So this is assuming that there's a concave uh, mirror that would uh, reflect the lights out. This wouldn't work in a transmissive case, because you need to have the screen basically magnifying the lenses. So here's a video of uh, our system. We have a set of video projectors. Uh, reflecting off a anisotropic screen. It has a wide 110 degree field of view. Uh, the, the content that you're seeing here on the screen is actually 3D geometry of a face scanned in our light stage device, uh, all being rendered in real time. So as I mentioned, there's uh, 72 video projectors. We're using uh, the Texas Instruments uh, Pico projectors. Uh, which are LCD projectors. Uh, we chose them basically, as far as I know, the, they were the smallest projectors that were commercially available. So we could stack them really close together with only 1.6 degrees between projectors. Uh, this gives us a very high angular resolution and also the very wide field of view. Now, the screen material uh, has uh, two components. There's a, a lenticular lens, but this isn't a lenticular lens as people usually use it. Uh, usually, lenticular lenses are lined so the cylinders run vertically. But in this case, we're putting them horizontal, so it just takes light coming in and scatters it into a vertical plane. The second component is a holographic diffuser, which is not being used as a hologram, but it's just a light shaping diffuser so that it provides a slight angular blur to fill in all those gaps between the projectors. Uh, without any uh, diffusion, you actually see a set of stripes. And each of these stripes corresponds with one lens of a different projector. Uh, with a little bit of horizontal diffusion, uh, then this can become a seamless image. And ideally, the amount of diffusion should be approximately the angular spacing between projectors. So here's a video just showing with and without uh, the holographic diffuser. Uh, the other interesting effect is that adding the holographic diffuser actually slightly increases the perceived spatial resolution of the display, because you're actually blurring in pixels that would be seen by the person on your right or on to the left into your view. And this is something that will be interesting to explore further in the future. Uh, we also have uh, done both a front and rear projection system. In this case, it's a transmissive screen uh, using uh, two, uh, two degrees of horizontal diffusion plus the uh, lenticular screen. You can also model it as a uh, front projection system. In this case, uh, we painted the back of the lenticular screen uh, black and are just using the front surface reflection of the uh, plastic. And we only need to have one sheet of diffusion here because the light's actually transmitting through the holographic diffuser twice. Now, one of the, cool, uh, one of the fun things here is that we were generating all our images on a single computer. Uh, we used four uh, ATI Ifinity cards, each with six video outputs for a total of 24. Uh, and then uh, here's the, what the desktop looks like. 
uh, we're using the Display Fusion uh, commercial software to m basically handle this massive desktop. Now, to go from 24 video outputs to 72, uh, we use the Matrox triple head to go video splitters uh, that take one video, out video input and split it into three uh, outputs. So we can get 72 uh, displays all hooked up to a single computer. Next step is to calibrate the system. We uh, model the calibration as a simple uh, 2D rectification that lines all the projector images up to the uh, display. And we simply project a uh, AR marker, which we can automatically detect in a uh, fixed camera. Uh, now, how do we actually render these images? And as I mentioned earlier, we actually have to render these multiple center of projection images. And these are because each uh, eye sees images or pixels from multiple uh, projectors. And similarly, each projector now has to generate different rays that are rendered for multiple viewers. So a better way to look at this is what do these images actually have to look like? And this is what we render. And the first thing to notice is that this is, a, this is a left sort of center and right projector, is that you sort of have this unwrapped view of the face. So part of this image is rendered from the side of the head, uh, and then another part of the image is sort of rendered more from the front, because these pixels are going to be seen by different viewers. The next thing to remember is that different viewers could be different heights. So if we have a viewer on the left is now sort of at a straight on view, uh, they're going to see the front of the uh, cube whereas a viewer from the, uh, in the middle might be higher up, so they can see more of the top of the view. And we want to be able to seamlessly transition between these two uh, perspectives. So first I'm going to review how would you generate these multiple center of projection images for a uh, single uh, viewer height. And one way you could do it is you would render a m very large number of horizontal and vertical just traditional perspective views, and then you could resample those images to create these multiple center of projection images. Um, that's fairly inefficient because you're rendering a much larger number of views than you actually need, sort of extra pixels. And secondly, you're adding an extra resampling step. So what we do is we take 3D geometry, basically uh, take our 3D vertices, and we come up with a custom uh, vertex projection algorithm uh, implemented as a vertex shader that maps these, renders these uh, vertices to the screen based on which viewer will see this particular vertex. So we start up with a, a particular vertex, and then we trace a ray from a given projector out uh, to find the nearest viewer. And the, the set of viewers for a constant height could be viewed as just a single circle of viewers, all at the same height. So we find a viewer that will see this particular ray. Uh, then we go up to the whatever height they are at, and we trace back through the, uh, back to the projector through the screen, and this gives us the point where this, project, this particular vertex should actually be displayed. Now, if we have multiple viewers at different heights, we can take the nearest two viewers to a particular array and represent them as two different circles at different heights and distances. We take the same array and intersect it with both circles, so we get two intersection points. Now, neither of the tracked viewers would necessarily lie on this ray, so we have to interpolate between the two nearest viewers. And we do this uh, by looking at the angle between the intersection point and the original, uh, the tracked viewer positions. And then the, we compute a weighted average uh, based on these two angles. And then once we have that average point, we can then reproject back onto the screen as before. Now, uh, in practice, we use a, uh, our average is computed using a uh, Gaussian interpolation. So as you move further away from a particular viewer, there's a sort of a Gaussian fall off. Uh, we try and make the width of this Gaussian equivalent to the width of a human's shoulders. So as long as someone's not actually looking over your shoulder, there won't be any crosstalk between views. Secondly, we also incorporate a default height and distance. So as you move further away from a particular tracked viewer position, or if someone's untracked, then they will still see a reasonable uh, perspective. The third thing is that you can also modulate these uh, weights by the confidence of your tracking system. So if you are very confident in a, a particular viewer, then you can use the track position. And as someone maybe arrives or leaves and their confidence is lower, then it will just transition back to the default height and distance. So this uh, shows what the interpolated height would be. 
Uh, we do, for our system, we track using a Microsoft Connect, which can track about two to six uh, viewers. Uh, this provides both height and depth, and here at the bottom is the interpolated uh, height. So these two uh, regions here correspond to the height, interpolated height of these two viewers, which smoothly moves uh, as they move around. So this is what the interpolated uh, vertical parallax looks like. On the left, this is our proposed algorithm, which as you move back and forth, smoothly interpolates between different heights. Now on the right, uh, this is a technique where you assume that for each projector frame, all the heights are constant. And this results in image tearing, uh, basically where you're seeing images that were intended for the person on your left or the person on your right, and they might be at different heights. Um, and there's two different algorithms here. One, it shows a abrupt uh, fall off or transition from one height to the other, and the other shows the smooth Gaussian. Um, most of the results I'm gonna show later on are all using the smooth Gaussian. Uh, using per vertex, uh, view blending also reduces crosstalk. So in this case, we have a untracked viewer here that's staying stationary, and we have this uh, actively moving uh, tracked viewer. And as he moves close to this uh, untracked viewer, ideally this view uh, remains fixed. Now if you use per vertex, I mean, constant uh, height across each projector frame, there's gonna be significant crosstalk uh, whenever this tracked viewer moves uh, close to this uh, untracked viewer. So another thing we explore in the paper is uh, different mirror shapes. So uh, I mentioned earlier that using a, f a flat screen, you use a holographic diffuser to fill in the gaps. Now if you actually curve the uh, shape of the screen using a con uh, convex mirror, you can actually increase the, uh, decrease the spacing between the stripes. And what's happening here is that you're actually magnifying the position of the projectors so that they are closer to the screen and have smaller gaps behind the uh, screen. And so this only really works for a front projection case. Um, now, there's a, if one issue is that this uh, magnification is only really true for the center of the screen. And as you move towards the edge of the screen, uh, different rays will no longer converge on a single point. So we came up with an algorithm that would uh, basically improve this, you can start off with just averaging those intersection points and use that to project onto the screen uh, as I described earlier and get a screen point. Um, but then you can then refine uh, the projector position by using the local neighborhood around this projected position and, fi and find a new intersected uh, virtual projector position. Uh, and then we simulated a whole bunch of different mirror shapes even beyond the ones that we could physically build and there's more details about that uh, in the paper. But these are the uh, virtual positions. And these are the images that you'd have to send to all these unbuilt displays. Uh, here's the vertical parallax using a uh, curved screen. And you can see there's still a consistent perspective. Um, our system runs in real time, so we can have dynamic scenes. This is a dynamic uh, scene with uh, structured light geometry. And uh, finally, because we were all inspired by Star Wars and uh, trying to re recreate uh, Princess Leia, we stuck Princess Leia on the display. So this is uh, Lego Princess Leia. Uh, until I can actually get a scan of Carrie Fisher, this is the best I can do. So future work, um, we want to, as projectors become smaller and cheaper, we should be able to build a brighter, much larger display, perhaps one that actually goes full 360 degrees around. Um, right now we're treating the uh, tracking as pretty much a black box, but as you, uh, there are future improvements in tracking technology, we believe that this should be easily incorporated into our system. And finally, I mean, one of the biggest hassles is just Windows is really not designed to support this number of projectors and it's not auto stereoscopic. So if there's better ways of incorporating 3D functionality into the OS, that would make the system a lot more practical. So uh, in conclusion, we've presented a hybrid parallax technique. Uh, it provides instantaneous horizontal parallax uh, with tracked vertical parallax, and I think this is a good uh, compromise given how people tend not to move as much vertically, but you can still get accurate perspective from all positions. Uh, it handles multiple users, and it's robust to uh, tracking errors. So with that, I will take any questions.